Hey, what's up? My name is Zahud Hidami. I am an actor and a real estate agent, a co-founder and principal of the Catalyst team at Compass. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have friends who love New York as much as we do. And we have friends who love supporting small businesses in New York as much as we do. So every week we're, we're bringing on and inviting uh, friends of ours who we love and admire uh, to talk about their New York. So we're going to have a New York conversation. So this week we have a special, uh, amazing guest. Um, his name is Michael O'Keefe. Uh, some of you may know him as... Fred from uh, the television sitcom uh, from Roseanne or uh, Danny Noonan in Caddyshack. Um, let me see if I can get him on here. And um, Ben Meacham in The Great Santini, for which he was uh, nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to have him on. He is joining now, um, as as all this this consistently pretty much happens, where uh, we're going to make sure he is available and connected. I've known Michael for quite some time. Um, he's not only a, a talented actor, but just a really awesome uh, and amazing person. Oh, here you, here you are, Michael. I'm going to invite you to join. Um, this and you just hit accept and then we'll be on together um i'm excited to hear uh there you are what's up we did it it's the future here we are we're talking and we're on computers we are isn't it wild and amazing yeah i just want i'm just i just want to make sure i look good hey you look you look fantastic you look really good thank you so much dude you're right I, I <laughs> Hey, thanks so much for for hanging out with us today. Um, you you know, we're honored to have you. Honestly, I'm 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 a little uh, verklempt. You're such an amazing, successful actor, and you know I because what I want to do is talk a, a I lot just about. Here you're talking to me because I was just wanting to make sure there wasn't someone <laughs> behind me you were referencing with those <laughs> modifiers. Okay, <laughs> successful. Yes. Uh, okay, if you say so. <laughs> Um, you're already getting love, Emily. Emily's sending lots of love to you. Um, so I want to talk. So one of the things I want to I want to talk about you're in New York because it's important to talk about New York, uh, and that's why we're on today. And then I want to also uh, talk a lot about the small businesses. But you have been such you've had such an amazing, wonderful career in your craft, and I'd love for you to share with us uh, a little bit of. Do you have some secrets to your success? What would you um, say are, are some good recipes? Uh, I would say learn more from your failures than your success would be my first uh, aphorism. And I'll try not to speak aphoristically anymore. But you know, <laughs> what you remind me of was when I was a teenager, I was growing up in Westchester and I had this idea to be an actor when I was about 15. And a, a lot of things came together to make that happen. And probably one of the most important is that I was accepted to a teen program at the American Academy of Dramatic Art, which is on Madison Avenue at 28th Street, and is still there. And synchronistically, the last time I checked in, it was being run by a guy named Dino Scopus, who I actually was in a production with at the American Academy in 1970, 1971, mm -hmm. when I was just starting out. He went on to end up running the school years later. Um, so that was my, one of my first connections to New York. You know, I made a connection to these theatrical agents and I used to, I didn't really have a lot of money and I used to hide on the train, um, um, what's called the Stamford Local, which is the train that goes from Larchmont into the city. And I'd hide in the bathroom and there was this Irish conductor who finally figured out, like when he saw me, he was like, uh, there goes that kid's gonna hide in the bathroom again. So <laughs> he would, I would always get busted and he, He'd try to kick me off the train in Harlem and I'd beg, you know, because I was this scared kid from the suburbs. I'd beg to be let off, you know, in Larchmont and my parents would pay later, that kind of thing. Um, and then I just started going to auditions, you know, and finding my way. And I, you know, I used to carry a, we used to call a dance bag back in the day. And 
somehow, you know, people got to my head about taking dance and there was a great dance studio at 50th and Broadway that's no longer there called Phil Black's mm. Dance Studio. And he was like a tap, jazz, Broadway kind of chorus master. And that's where I actually met Irene Cara, who was the great young singer who sang Fame uh, and had a, has a career as a rhythm and blues singer. And she's an extraordinary talent. And we became friends and I started finding my way into that New York theater scene when I was 15 years old. And, and um, to this day, those were the most like formative New York moments for me. And um, three years ago now, two and a half years ago, I did a, um, a play at um, the Cherry Lane on, on Commerce Street. And that was really a bucket list kind of thing for me. And I was going to a yoga class at Moto Yoga on 6th Avenue and 12th before the show. And, you know, running into Jill Hennessy, who's mm -hmm. on a uh, city on a hill, the show that mm -hmm. I'm doing. And Suzy Roach, the great singer, uh, songwriter, part of the Roaches Sisters group, who I'm now actually writing songs with. Like, I, I was about to say, even as, even as we speak, but it's not like she's right here in the room with me to say hello. But we've been writing <laughs> songs together recently, which is a whole nother kind of great thing wow. but you know so new york became my kind of um you know my test field my my place to explore my place to try to i don't want to sound too precious but to dare to do what oh. i to do because there was no you know aside from i did have a really interesting connection in my family which i've actually this year somehow tried to regenerate and that was that in terms of being having a family in the performing arts Right. My mother's first cousin was named Sono Osato. And at the age of 14 or 15, she was a ballet dancer and she got an audition with the Ballet Russe and she was accepted. And mm -hmm. she went on to dance for, I think, 14 years at Ballet Russe with the great dancers like Leonoid Maislin, who's the, if you're, you're familiar with this amazing film called The Red Shoes. Um, he plays the choreographer in the Red Shoes, who's the shoemaker in the ballet about the Red Shoes. Okay. So she danced with him, and all of those dancers that are in that movie were in the same troupe as her. Hmm. My mother referenced her to me a lot when I was a teenager, as if, you know, we do, you know, because my mother was from a rather well-off, snooty family, and... <laughs> And they had a little bit of, as opposed to my father's family, there was, you know, my, my grandfather was in New York City. Here's another New York connection. My grandfather was a New York City cop uh, in the Bronx. Wow. But, yeah. But my mother's first cousin was this huge force in the dance world. And she lived until she was about 103 years old. Mm -hmm. And wow. she, yeah, she provided scholarships to dancers. So I was going to this yoga class and then going down the street to the theater to the cherry lane to do this Charles Me play with a dance bag on my shoulder, just like I did when I was a teenager, because I had my yoga togs in the dance bag. And it, you know, and in that way, it all, you know, kind of worked out in the, mm. in the strangest way. And I have no idea why, except I was reminded, I, I saw, um, um, I think Mark Burman gave a talk once at SMU when I was in Dallas making a movie and they'd given him some kind of lifetime achievement award. And, and someone asked him, how do you write? And he said, more or less, I throw the spear of, I, I throw the spear of my intellect out into the creative jungle. Mm. Uh, sorry, the spear of my creativity. I throw the spear of my creativity out into the jungle and I send the army of my intellect to find it, mm. you know, and, and not knowing, you know, much about Bergman when I was 15 or 16. Um, but I kind of did that. I kind of just threw this, you know, roll of the dice about yeah. an actor. And then, you know, now it's 50 years later and it all kind of worked out. I love that. I, I love that you said New York is a place where you can dare. Well, you know, it's, it's so, that's so like, Right on, I think. Um, so let me ask you this. New York, and this kind of leads to this first question, which is New York is your place, why? Well, you know, if I, you know, I listened to Frank Sinatra assiduously and I knew if I could make it there, I could make it anywhere. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, that's where the theater scene was happening when I was young. 
And now, you know, there's other great theater companies like Steppenwolf in Chicago that have made their way and um, the Actors Gang in, the, in New York and also in LA. But also one of my favorite acting companies ever is the Labyrinth Company in New York. And I've been fortunate to work with a few of those people like Stephen Adley Gurgis and Stephen Belber, another great playwright, and Portia, yep. Portia who goes by one name only, Portia, just Portia. Uh, Portia and I have done two plays together. I, I, David Zayas and I did a movie together. I, I, have, hmm. the, I have the most, um, John Ortiz and I actually toured together, uh, A Few Good Men, the um, play by, what's that writer's name? I always forget his name. Um, a Few Good Men? Yeah, Elon, Elon, no, Aaron Sorkin. Sorry, I forgot his name for a second. <laughs> um, so he, um, you know, John and I did the tour of that. And, you know, he was the ingenue in, in, mm. in that tour. This was 30 years ago. It was 1992. And now, of course, John's, you know, one of the great leaders of the lab, um, one of its really fine directors, actors, and, you know, and champions. So, you know, I've had a chance to work with all those people because I took the risk of, you know, going to New York and, you know, I dropped out of NYU after, they were making unreasonable demands upon my time and energy at NYU. Mm. Um, I was not an acting student, I was an English major. They, you know, they wanted me to show up for class. They <laughs> wanted me to write papers. <laughs> I thought this was entirely unreasonable. What are they, what are they asking you to do all these things for? I really, I don't think they had any idea who I was, dude. <laughs> <laughs> they would soon learn. Yeah, and right, and so though. And then I dropped out, and and um, and I did a play at the Public Theater with Barbara Barry, who's still with us. You know, she I think she's eighty nine or ninety years old this year, and and you know, there's this great play. You know, Dee Dee O'Connell, mm -hmm. uh, and this great director Les Waters has done a piece with her that Lucas Nath wrote. This one woman show about Lucas's mother, and at the opening night. Barbara Barry was there and she played my mother when I was 19 years old, when I dropped out of college. Wow. And I was such a handful back then. I was this crazy young, you know, back in the seventies, if you weren't nuts, you didn't think you were gonna have what it took to be a part of the scene, which of course was not, not only not true, but not necessary nor helpful to those that I was working with and getting to know. But I didn't know that back then. And she was so patient with me. And I said to her, I didn't quite make an amends, but I came pretty close to saying, you know, Barbara, you really endure a great deal of my craziness and my youth, and I owe you big time. But she's also one of those New York legends who, you know, we don't see her like as a star in the sense of, you know, this kind of Hollywood um, status game that a lot of actors are caught up in. Yeah. Um, you know, not that I wouldn't mind being a, a star, but that, you know, I'm not. So but she's she's this one of these great examples of the New York actor. Mm -hmm. You know, like they would have her a guest star on Mary Tyler Moore. They would have her a guest star on Barney Miller. They'd have her a guest star on All in the Family, you know, and um, and then she would be back in New York doing company on Broadway, um, you know, or, or some great off Broadway thing. And she had this. Play. She was married to Jay Harnick, who was Sheldon Harnick's, one of the uh, composers of A Fiddler on Roof. Jay was also a Broadway composer. So, you know, she was, she's that Upper West Side, West End Avenue, pre-war building, great apartment with a view of the Hudson, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, she was always cultivating friendships with people in the business. And I was so lucky when I was young to somehow fall under the good graces of those people. Mm. And they gave me a place to go um, besides, you know, my parents' house, which, you know, didn't really work for me, you know, <laughs> by, yeah. by the time I was 18, that wasn't exactly home, if you know what I mean. Yeah. This is uh, lovely. The, the, it's very clear why New York is your home. Is there, uh, do you have like a favorite corner? Well, you know, I, the thing about being at the Cherry Lane that was so great, you know, I lived, as you know, you know, our friend David McMahon lives on Ninth Avenue between 21st and 20th Street. I lived on 21st Street between 9th and 10th for almost 10 years, directly across from the General Theological Seminary. Mm -hmm.
And it was the quintessential kind of New York Italianate townhouse. And I had a garden in the back. And I can now tell you this because this worked out for everybody. But the park behind it is Samuel Clement Park. That's okay. not the Samuel Clement that wrote, uh, uh, you know, it's not Mark Twain. But it's the park, I think Clement Park, the guy who wrote Twas the Night Before Christmas. It was named for him. Oh, wow. So it's this little teeny park at 22nd and 10th on the south side of the street, right across the street from the Empire Diner, right? On the uh, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right? Yeah. So now cut to Bruce Springsteen had a singer in his band named Patty Schiaffa, who lived in the Lincoln Tower apartments on 23rd Street between 9th and 10th. And before their romance went public and before they became, you know, a family and marrying their kids, that's where they used to meet in that mm. park at 22nd and 10th because they didn't want it to get out that they were seeing each other. And, you know, Bruce had to get divorced from Julianne Phillips. And, you know, they were trying to kind of keep it under wraps. And so when I, when I told them um, once, you know, like in conversation that I lived where I lived in Manhattan, they, you know, Bruce was like, oh, yeah, man, I swear I used to meet Patty. <laughs> Patty at that park, man. What's the name of that park? And I was like, oh, my God. So had I only known, I would have been able to, like, look out, because it was when I was living there, I would have been able to look out the window and be like, isn't that Bruce Springsteen making out with that redhead out there? Like, What's happening out there right now? <laughs> Oh my God! Did you 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 lived in it in the? Did you have a floor in the townhouse? I owned or? the whole house, and I lived in the bottom two floors as a duplex. And guess who my first tenants were? You'll never guess who. My first tenants in that house were Chris Stein and Debbie Harry. Get out of here! Yeah, so they shared a house with me all through the eighties. <laughs> and what was so great was that first of all, you know, they're like this you know, the, and, and well-deserved punk rock and roll legends who like made that whole 70s CBGB scene yeah. work and they're still doing it. You know what I mean? They're, they're yeah. still relevant, if, you know, which I like to say about artists, you know, of my age who, who stick around. Um, <laughs> so, but you know, we're in this Italian eights townhouse with like, you know, brick molding and iron gates and wisteria. And I would go up to their apartment because they lived in the duplex above me yeah, and they had this table in their living room with big chairs with skulls on each, like, you know, like a, they were like two poster chairs, the way you have four posters, and they had skulls, like these goth tripping skulls of like death on each <laughs> chair. And it was, it was like, your parents didn't give you that for the, that wasn't in the wedding registry. Was it the chairs? <laughs> skulls? Where'd you get those? So they were my tenants for years, you know? Wow. That was great, man. They were uh, they were totally cool. They were all part of that neighborhood. You know, that place right at the corner of 21st and 9th, that great little restaurant that's there now, it used to be called the L&S Dairy, and it was a delicatessen. Oh. And right next door to that, Loudon Wainwright III and Suzy Roach were married and were ra raising Lucy Wainwright Roach, the great singer. Wow. So at that point, Lucy was three. And they lived next door to the LNS Dairy. And so I would see them in the neighborhood all the time. And I would go to the dairy because, you know, I was living in a townhouse. I didn't have a doorman and my agents were like sending me scripts. So I'd go to the dairy and I'd say, hey, would you mind if like I got packages delivered here? And they said, yeah, they're totally cool. They were this great couple. They lived on the block. Peter and Carol were their names. And it was like a mom and pop deli. It wow. Wasn't, it wasn't the fancy schmancy restaurant it is now. And so. Well, then my agents who were in California send me these packages and my agent goes, Michael, where are we, where are we sending this? I said, yeah, you send it to the LNS Dairy <laughs> at 189th Avenue, New York, New York, you know, 10021. They were like, is there, are there like cows <laughs> on 9th Avenue? Like, what are you talking about? Why is it called a dairy? But you know, that's what we called, that's what they called their place, you know? I love, I love, I love your stories, Michael. <laughs> They're so wonderful. Wait, well, you know what's there now? It's a, it's a uh, French, uh, French place called La Bergamote. Yeah, La Bergamote. Yeah, yeah it's, which, uh, is, which, I, is, which is French for acrid tea. I don't know if you knew that or not. Bergamot. I did not. 
No, it's not. It's not French for after tea, de hoot. <laughs> bergamot is an herb that you put in tea. There's such a thing as bergamot tea, but oh. these are just the jokes. And if they don't land, we'll just keep moving on. It's not. I'm I'm so gullible. It's so. <laughs> so you live there, and where? And um, I don't know. You moved. Did you move to New York from to do? Uh, to you pursued. Is this when you moved to and you went to NYU? Is that why you came to New York initially? Yeah, but you know, first I lived in the dorms at NYU in the village at Samuel Rubin, and then that dorm that's on uh, Wa Waverly and um, sorry University Place and like Ninth Street, uh, you know, between Ninth and the Park there. Yeah, that's still there. And then I moved out and I lived with Jamie Widows, who was the head of the Delta frat in Animal House, the big tall redheaded guy. We were roommates. Oh. He was an acting student at NYU and I was not. Um, that was, on, I lived on uh, East 4th Street, 104 East 4th, across the street from the um, police department on uh, 5th between 1st um, and 2nd. And then the Hells Angels were on 3rd. And La Mama was on 4th, uh, further east of me. And I used to kind of walk by them all the time. It was very, they were, I never worked there, but they were very much on my radar. Wow. Then I lived at Waverly Place for a while in the village. Wow. Um, I have a very important phone call to him. Is that your agent? I wish. <laughs> I wish I haven't worked since the quarantine, but I'm, I'm okay with it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not worried about it. What are you talking about? I, and I told you this over the phone. You, uh, uh, City on the Hill, your character in that show is, is one of my favorites because I love watching how you deal with different characters throughout uh the series and and how your your uh your how you deal with city officials versus really the person you work for right would you characterize yeah i mean you're actually saying things that make me feel really good about my work you know and that was also <laughs> a great show that you know kevin bacon and aldous hodge starring and um, I love your chemistry with him. You guys uh, make really, like, it's really fun to watch y'all together. Well, you know, I know Kevin for 40 years. I worked with Kira years ago when she had the closer. But Kevin and I kind of like, you know, a lot of like, guys my age, we all broke in the same time. I used to see Kevin at the same gym that I went to in the 70s. When I lived at 104th and Riverside, there was a gym at 96th and West End we used to go to. And you'd see actors there all the time. And Kevin, I would see there all the time. And I actually been offered a role in Diner, the great movie that Kevin did uh, with Mickey Rourke and Tim Daly and um, Steve uh, Gutenberg that Barry Levinson wrote and directed. But I turned it down to do something else. So I came that close to working with Kevin oh. at 25. But then all of a sudden, 40 years later, this thing came around and, you know, he directed me in one of the shows. But you know, the show, the premise of the show, as you know, but it just for your your listeners uh, who, who may not know, is, a, is about an FBI agent who forms an unlikely alliance with a district attorney in Boston during the 90s and affects a kind of huge shift in the um, crime rate in Boston. It's more or less based on a, that part of it's a true story. Hmm. Uh, and there were a, a, like a drop of 85 percent of the crime in Boston kind of disappeared during their, these guys. Uh, rain, as it were. But of course, Kevin's character is thoroughly corrupt. I'm not sure that's true of the actual FBI agent. Mm. But he's being written brilliantly by this young writer, Charles McLean, and then being run by Tom Fan Fontana, who's like a TV legend. Yes, he so is. The show, you know, as you know, it's this FBI thing where Kevin's manipulating everybody and doing everything he can to kind of find a way through all these lies that he's, you know, woven this web of. And, um, so my friend Terrence Winch, the great poet, refers to this show not as City on a Hill, but as Kevin Bacon Against the Universe. <laughs> I think is actually a better, better title. I love that title. I love that too. It's really great and you're wonderful in it. I wanna go back. You were telling me about places you lived in when you first moved here. Do you remember what you first paid in your, what your first like, oh, yeah. your rental price or? Oh, uh, yeah. The apartment on, on East 4th Street was $200 a month, and oh. I, I shared it with someone. The apartment on Waverly was a little more expensive because it was in a tonier neighborhood. That was like $300 a month. Then I moved from there, and I got my own. That was sort of a sublet, which was an illegal sublet. But then I moved to 95th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam, and I had a one-bedroom apartment. 
that had been in a converted townhouse that wasn't a great conversion. In fact, my downstairs neighbor, downstairs neighbor actually tried to take me to court for noise because the construction wasn't, you know, between the apartments wasn't great. And she was always being driven crazy by my youthful endeavors. And so in that apartment, uh, I paid $250 a month. And I lived in that apartment for three years. And then I moved uh, because I made a movie and made some money. Um, and I bought a, a co-op, if you can believe it. And this was in 1980. And I bought this co-op for $30,000. And it was a one bedroom apartment on Riverside Drive and 104th Street. And wow. yeah, and then I sold it five years later for about $68,000, something like that. That's great. Yeah, and then I made this huge leap because my film career had taken off. And I bought that townhouse that I mentioned. In Chelsea. Yeah, and that I bought for $750,000. Wow. The, the only way I could afford it, because I didn't have that, obviously. Yeah. But I did have $150,000 that I could put up. Um, but the rent, Debbie and Chris renting that apartment paid by mortgage. Yes. So, that is the smart investor. Right. We have, we have buyers who do this, actually. Yeah. And, and the reality is, is that 750 or 1 million or 5 million or 10 million, usually uh, people are getting a mortgage and only putting down whatever they want to put down. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then they're having uh, tenants essentially pay for whatever their monthly costs are, which I think is such a smart way to approach it. Uh, That's what I did. And then I sold that building in 90, I want to say like 92, uh, because that was the year I did that national tour of Few Good Men. I was dating Bonnie Raitt. Um, and we had, we'd actually, I think at that point, got married either just before the tour or just after it. It's all a little vague in my head now. But yeah. we bought a house together in Marin County. And um, uh, so in order for me to actually participate in that purchase, because I didn't want to be the guy that was like, yeah, baby, you're a rock star. You buy the house. You know, I <laughs> kind of came in, came in on the, on the purchase of the house. So in order to do that, I had to sell the townhouse in New York. Oh. And, and just last week, I forgave Bonnie for, for putting me in a position where I sold my New York townhouse. You know, so it's, it only took me 30 years to get <laughs> over it, but I'm... I'm totally fine with it now. <laughs> I love that. Was there, was there, let me ask you this, because and because I, I want to hear about your small businesses that you love, because so much of this whole thing started from a place of really focusing on uh, talking about and supporting small businesses that we love, uh, that I want to hear the, the small businesses that, that you want to support, because we're going to repost this and then tag them so that, uh, you know, we can give them as much love as possible. But let me ask you this question. Was there, was there an event or um, did something happen along the way that made you fall in love with New York? Was there, what made you uh, fall in love with New York? Well, you know, I had watched as a kid a lot of movies. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And, and watching that musical number with Gene Kelly where the Bronx is up and the battery's down and the people riding the hole in the ground, you know? Um, watching the Bowery Boys when I was a kid, you know, and, and Leo mm. Percy and Hunts Hall and all these great young kid actors, you know, um, watching Jimmy Cagney and, and Bogart in those New York, you know, and we didn't have like TCM like that when I was a kid. Like you had to get the newspaper or a TV guide magazine. Then you had to go in there and say, what's listed? And, you know, I obsessively watched television at a very young age. And partly because I think I kind of figured out that I wanted to be an actor. And, and I'll tell you how I figured it out. I was watching, there's a great show. Jennifer, Jason's Lee, Jennifer Jason Lee's father was a wonderful character actor named Vic Morrow. He had a show mm. called Combat, which was mm. set in World War II. And every week, this small troop of men, there was a guy called Little John, who was like eight foot two. There was a guy named Kirby who had a special kind of repeating rifle and he was this 
weird kind of cat. There was their French liaison, you know, who was like Frenchy, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there was a lieutenant who kind of gave them their marching orders. And every week they went out and accomplished something during World War II. And then there were guest actors. And one day, there, one, one episode, there was a guest actor and, um, and a number of other, like, you know, uh, three or four other characters that were all guest actors on the show. And they were about to go off on a mission. And I was nine years old and I was with my father and I turned to him and I said, see those other guys over there that just came in that, with that young guy, that, the young new guy? And my dad said, yeah, I said, they're all gonna die. <laughs> nine, and my father said, how do you know they're all gonna die? I said, because oh, those, those other guys are coming back next week. <laughs> had somehow figured out what an actor was at a really young age, you know? And then I started thinking, you know, maybe I can do this. Mm. And, um, and so then, you know, it was for me, you know, the people I admired that were coming up like just before, like I saw Meryl Streep give her first performances at the public theater. Mm. You know, um, I saw John Hurd and um, Guy Boyd and Michael Weller's plays. Mm. Um, fishing and, and um, um, so it sounds like there are moments that made you fall in love with the city yeah rather than just one event yeah because there was the idea of New York and then all of a sudden at 18 I was just I mean at 15 I had started commuting down there to work but at yeah 18, I was just I was a New Yorker I was in I was all in yeah I had a New York driver's license I was in New York City my address was in New York and I wasn't going home except maybe on Thanksgiving. And you know, back then we used to call it the 104 Club. I did Sideman on Broadway. I was fortunate enough to replace Frank Wood, who's a wonderful, wonderful actor who had originated the who? role. Huh? Frank Wood. Oh yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah, he won the Tony Award for this role. He, he played essentially Warren Light's father, mm -hmm. Warren, who was a great writer who, who wrote Sideman and has been running Law & Order SVU for the last number of years. Um, had, had um, cast me when Frank left the show. And so in the show, the musicians, because Warren's dad was a trumpet player, a sideman, as it were, they go to get their unemployment check, which was $104 a week. And we used to call it the 104 Club. So when I had to do that in the play, I was like, I used to do that. That's how I got by. So you would get a, you'd book a commercial, then you'd go and uh, file for unemployment, then you'd get several months of unemployment, which was $104 a week. My rent was $200 a month that I was splitting. So my rent was $100 a month. And then I would just be in New York and go to audition yeah. and hang out with my friends. And like, there was this great, like I was thinking my favorite places in New York. I know you want to shout out relevant businesses that are open. But yes. We used to go to this place called Dave's Luncheonette at Canal and Broadway. That's not there anymore because story that went around town was that they got into trouble with the IRS. Mm. It, Dave's had a counter, besides being a great old fashioned luncheonette, they had a counter outside on Broadway on the south side of Canal, southeast side of Broadway and Canal. And so you could go up to a counter and stay on the street. And for guys like me that were getting really high and smoking a lot of <laughs> marijuana and had to have a chocolate egg cream, this was like heaven. <laughs> And we would like find it, we'd be like two in the morning, and we'd be high, and we'd be like at 78th and 3rd. And somebody would say, hey man, we gotta go to Dave's. <laughs> yeah, Dave's. So then we'd hail a cab. The cabbie would be like, oh my God, these idiots are high in my back of my cab. And then <laughs> he would drop us at, at Canal and Broadway, and then we'd go up to the counter and be like, hey man, can we get an egg cream? And they'd be like, yeah. And they'd get Huge chocolate egg creams with their homemade chocolate sauce, you know, and that kind of white, foamy seltzer. Oh, my God. I mean, it was the best, you that know. That delicious. Yeah, I mean, it's, so, I mean, you know, that whole thing, I just, I suck. And the whole thing, too, then was, are you going to be an L.A. actor or a New York actor? They were very, very different animals. In a way, and it's still true. And um, and really, the the... the hallmark of the kind of like um notice the, the yeah the, the the tattoo as it were on the new york actor was theater mm -hmm. like, you were doing theater if you were doing off broadway i was working at the public theater um i worked at long wharf twice 
Um, you know, I was doing, you know, auditions for theater all the time. Um, I worked at uh, Playwrights Horizons. Um, I did five Broadway shows. I mean, when you do those things, then you're a New York actor. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to say a star driven vehicle where, and this is not a criticism of Bruce Willis, he comes in to do Misery on Broadway. Yeah. With Laurie Metcalf, who's a real stage actor because she came out of Steppenwolf. And I, I've been opposite Laurie. I, I did two years opposite her on Roseanne. And I've seen her on stage. She's amazing. Yeah. That, there's that. And it's not to say, it's not to criticize. Bruce Willis is a huge movie star with, you know, I have a lot of respect for him. Um, but he's not a New York actor. He's not. No, I, you say Bruce Willis and I think L.A. Yeah. So you say Michael O'Keefe, I think New York. So that's who I was. And then LA, you know, our agents, all of our agents, the guys that were working, the gals that were working back then, they all had offices in New York and LA. So you would go to LA and they all knew this and you would make money and then you would go back home because you knew you had to do theater. And when I signed, my agency in New York is called the Paradigm Agency. And I was literally the first acting client they signed in 1992. And I've been with them ever since. It's been 30 years now. Amazing. 30 years. And the sole reason I signed with them, you know, besides the fact that they were great and, they were, I, you know, they, they wooed me, which was fun. But the guy who helped start the agency, one of the partners was Clifford Stevens, who's a New York legend. Hmm. He represented Jason Robards, mm -hmm. um, Colleen, Duhor, Colleen Dewhurst, Michael Moriarty, Walter McGann, um, all these great New York actors who I just like, you know, thought the world of. And yeah, I, he had that reputation in New York. I knew about him by the time I was 19 or 20 years old. And then cut to I was in my mid 30s, 35 or 36. He asked to sign me. And I jumped at the chance because I knew by signing with him, I could do a play at the Laura Pell's Theater, you know, or at Manhattan Theater Club. And not only would he not give me a hard time about it because it wasn't a money making endeavor, but he would come to the show and he'd call me during rehearsals. He want to know about the journey. How's the journey? What's happening? You, That's awesome. So those no are, agent talks about the process. They just <laughs> no. He was he was one of these theater nerds, you know, that yeah. loved it. We just lost him like two or three years ago, and it's a huge guys like him oh, were in New York in the 1950s and the 1960s. Yeah. They're the ones that were behind in, the, in terms of the theater scene. They were the ones behind the scene making it happen. Um, you know, guys like that, I got to know like. You know, Bill Tresh, this great New York manager that I got to be friends. I never worked with him, but I, you know, I knew him and I knew a lot of his clients. And he came to see me. I did Reckless on Broadway with Mary Louise Parker in 2003 or four. And he came to see me in the play. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. And he was in a wheelchair, but he mm. was in the theater. And then I was like, Bill. And he's like, oh, you're so good in this. And, you know, yeah. like, that's, that's the whole thing about New York, you know, like, and you know this, when you're doing a play in New York, the best thing about it, if the show is good, is you know somebody's going to walk into the dressing room and you're going to be like, oh, my God, Mike Nichols is in the dressing room, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, Dame Judith Dench is in the dressing room, you know? Yeah. I mean? So those types of events, um, you know, and it still happens. That's the beauty of New York. It's the place to make it... Um, mm -hmm you know, to be to, to be seen and be seen. And I don't mean that in a kind of pejorative, superficial way. I mean, right. it's the standard for what we, when we talk about theater, you have to reach that standard. And if you do, then you're doing theater at, a, at, a, at the penultimate, you know, at the ultimate level. Like, for instance, you know, Steppenwolf or The Good Man in Chicago, equally good. The Magic Theater in San Francisco, equally good. Right. In a way, they were all trying to kind of live up to the standard that New York City had already set when they, when those venues got it, got started. Yeah, but Beth is saying that's so true about New York theater. You're listening to you, uh, Michael, it makes me so excited about the fact that we're reopening. The theaters are gonna open in the spring. And I, I'm, you know, it's like this renaissance that's happening in New York. It feels like it's just starting all over again in some, funny, weird way. Um, 
I only have a couple more minutes with you, but I want I would love for you to throw out a couple of small businesses that you love that we, we should support. Uh, because as New Yorkers and with the spirit of giving back and and really just supporting each other, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And then and then we're gonna end it by playing a really fun, cool game. We're gonna play a word association game. I'm gonna throw out a couple of uh, New York words, and then I want to hear the first things that pop in your head when I say them, okay? Hopefully there's some psychologists watching who can tell us the deeper meaning of what it is we're talking about. Okay. But I, you know, I just, like, I always want to shout out to my theater friends and theater companies, you know, like the Labyrinth Theater, the Cherry Lane Theater, the Signature Theater. You know, those places, like, I think there's a show after midnight now that I actually really want to go see its signature because it's about Harlem in the 30s, and it's got great dance in it. Springsteen's back on Broadway. It's the first Broadway show, you know what I mean? I, and I, I, you know, if you want to get in, you know, get in good with Bruce, tell him the story. I told you about the park at 22nd and 10th, you know, wait for him afterwards and said, I know where you used to hang out with Patty. <laughs> um, but, you know, John's Pizza on Bleecker Street. I mean, you know, legendary pizza, man. I mean, that, yeah. was, that was it for me, when, to be able to go to John's Pizza. Um, and then... Um, um, Suen, the, uh, the great macro place, which is on uh, uh, 6th Avenue below Houston Street. Um, Suen? Yeah, it's like a, uh, like a macrobiotic, one of the first macrobiotic places ever, ever created in the city. I is think, that like S-U-E? I think like it's S-O-E-N. S-O-E-N. Okay, cool. Yeah. I hope, uh, I, if I'm mispronouncing it, I hope they forgive me. But with a name like that, come on, I course I'm going to mispronounce yeah. it. No, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to look this up. We're going to tag them yeah. and everyone will be able to easily click on them and then go and support them. Cause that's really the, the goal and the purpose of this. Oh, and Beth knows Sue N. Um, okay. You ready? I'm going to throw out some words and you tell me the first thing uh, that pops in your head. I'm going to throw you a softball to start and then we're going to ready tourist. Get out of town. <laughs> Smoking like a true New Yorker. <laughs> uh, New York Times. Maureen Dowd. Oh, interesting. Park. Impossible. <laughs> what do you mean? Because you can't find a parking space in New York. Oh, that's interesting. Because when I wrote this, I was thinking like New York What's City. Riverside Park? Park. I used to play basketball in Riverside Park. So that was my favorite basketball spot. Bar restaurant. Joe Allen's, which unfortunately we lost, you know. Yeah. Heartbreak. I know, that's so, uh, uh, Joe Allen's is, was like a staple of oh. Broadway. Yeah, well, it was legendary. Burger joint. Uh, what are those places on the Upper West Side with like, you know, there's, there's like three of them and there's one right across the street from the, the Promenade Theater. Oh, man, I can't remember the names of those things. Because Joe Allen's, of course, had a killer burger. That's why we mainly went there. Uh, it's for the burgers. Oh, I'm going to remember this. It's something like, it's like at Wyoming, you know, or Montana, or uh, maybe those places aren't even there anymore. I can't remember. I'm such I a can't help you. Anyone, can anyone online help us? Um, it'll, it, maybe we'll get some backup. What about the Empire Diner always had great burgers. Empire Diner is still there, right? Yeah, it is sort of. It is. Okay, good. Maybe we need some to give some love. I oh, uh Linda Linda's saying Jackson Hole. That's it, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I knew Jackson it was Wyoming. Hole. Jackson Hole, the burgers in Jackson Hole. They were unbelievable. And they had they had like all these crazy like a Southwest burger and they would put like jalapeno and salsa and cheese and they'd double up the burger and I mean <laughs> like a heart attack on a roll, you know, it was amazing. Favorite place to take a tourist? Get out of town. I don't want to take them anywhere. You know, <laughs> I, I, never, I never did the things. You know, like, the only time I ever, like, went on the circle line, I was nine because my aunt took me there. And she was, you know, a resident of the Bronx. She grew up in the Bronx. And the only thing I remember about the circle line was that the Swiss cheese sandwich tastes like rubber. So <laughs> when my mom asked me what it was like, I said, no, Aunt B bought me this rubber sandwich. And yes, to your listeners, I had an Aunt B. Her name was Beatrice. She was my father's older sister. And her name was Beatrice O'Keefe. And she was my aunt. Yeah, yeah that's lovely. Um, two more. And then we're going to call it. Okay. Speakeasy cocktail spot. 
Whoa. Oh, man. The place in Grand Central Station, the Oyster Bar. Oh. You would go down and you would go down into the Oyster Bar. They had this great dish that was like a soup with oysters in it. I had a weird name. It was, you know, I can't remember what it's called now. It wasn't oyster soup, but they had a killer bar. Um, you know, like drinking Cosmopolitans there. We used to, as young actors, we used to go to the Allstate bar, which is not there anymore, but it was on 72nd Street. But the, you know that bar on 72nd and Broadway with the harp, the neon harp that is in the window, not in the window, but it kind of like sticks out like a sign from the bar. That is still there. We, we used to drink there, but I used to drink regularly at a place called the Colonnades Bar, which was in the Astor Place uh, Mansion, the uh, Astor Mansion, which was on Lafayette Street and Astor Place, which is where the Blue Man Group had their theater. Hmm. Two doors down, there was the Colonnades Bar, so I did some damage in there. Irish Bar, Beth the saying, still there. Oh, Exorlis, come on, you know, we used to go when there used to be sawdust on the floor, and they used to have liverwurst and onion sandwiches. <laughs> you mustard and, and whoever did that, the Irish would come up with this. And I don't why, know. Why? Because that way you could eat this horrible smelling sandwich and go home to your loved one, whoever that was. And when they asked you if you'd been drinking at McSorley's, you'd say no. And of course, <laughs> it would come out liverwurst and onions, not, not beer. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome story. All right, are you ready? We're going to take us home with this last one. Weirdest New York sighting. All right, so there's this great, Don I can't believe I remember this story. This great Donald Sutherland movie with Julie Christie called um, Don't Look Now. And it's a murder thing that takes place in Venice, Italy, not California. And he, uh, Donald Sutherland, has a number of moments in the movie where he has prescience and he sees the future and all of these murders are taking place and he doesn't know it. He's seeing his own funeral. There's a, sorry, plot spoiler. He's seeing his own funeral. <laughs> and he's, this uh, uh, Venice boat is going by and Julie Christie's dressed for a funeral and he calls out to her because they're married, but she doesn't hear him. It turns out it's his funeral. And there's a dwarf uh, in a red coat who's the murderer. And he finds this dwarf and he thinks it's a child. And then he turns it around. I'm getting chills thinking about it. And then he, the, the dwarf turns around and it's not a child, it's this weird looking dwarf with a knife and this dwarf kills Donald Sutherland. So I watched this movie in 1974, 75 at a theater like the Ziegfeld or something on, you know, uptown like in the 50s. And now I got to walk down to East 4th Street because I'm broke and I didn't want to pay for a cab and I didn't want to get on subways that late at night, you know. And so I now it's like, you know, it takes me like an hour to walk from 57th Street to 4th Street and I'm finally getting near my place. I'm on like St. Mark's. Nobody's there on the street. But coming towards me is a dwarf in a red <laughs> raincoat. And I'm like, ah, oh, please no. don't kill me. I, don't kill me. I never liked Donald Sutherland. I, I'm glad he's dead. Don't, don't kill me. And I really totally freaked out. And that was my just, and I've had some weird New York moments, but that was one of them, man. Oh my God, that's insane to me. Michael, you have the most amazing stories and I'm so honored and grateful to have you on uh, to share them with us. And we're gonna, we're gonna repost this and tag these small businesses and give all of our love and support because we're living in New York City that is growing and thriving and it's, it's getting its renaissance time. So I love that. Thank you so much for your time today. Dude, thanks for having me. You know, and like the song goes, I love New York. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Okay, talk to you soon.